It's a Friday afternoon, but we still have uh, a few fantastic speakers and presentations in store for you. And every year in the symposium on uh, the Friday during after lunch, we love to have uh, an artist come and speak with us. And we are so lucky today to have Jim Fraser, and uh, he'll be speaking about the Great Salt Lake landscape paying attention and reporting back. And he has actually been kind enough to save a couple minutes at the end for questions. So just as a reminder, if you do have questions, you can go to slido.com and uh, use the code hashtag Stegner. But Jim, we're so happy to have you and thank you so much uh, for speaking to us today. Well, um, thank you for having me. I certainly appreciate it. There isn't anything else we could be talking about, I don't think, that's more important. So uh, we've heard thoughts and opinions and analysis about the lake from a really wide variety of people and observers, and I'm here to give the artist's point of view or perspective. So we might ask, why it, could that be valuable? And one reason that many people uh, value uh, experiencing art is that it awakens in them an experience or a sense of wonder, something that we remember maybe only half consciously from when we were kids. Um, it's the feeling of seeing something for the first time without that feeling or filter of repeated exposure. Uh, and we want to keep those experiences. They're something that we want to kind of collect and treasure, like the especially pretty rock from the stream or the seashell from the shore. Uh, and so we keep them. And it's said that collecting is an attempt to use visible objects uh, for, uh, to connect with ideas and concepts, feelings that are invisible outside of the physical realm. So wonder and mystery then give way to curiosity and the urge to find things out. And this is the point at which any of us can go from looking to participating. The conceptual artist, Joseph Boys, famously said, everyone is an artist. And an extension of that is Everyone is an artist, but only the artist knows it. T to me, that saying that the working methods of art are accessible to everyone, but it's up to the individual to decide to use them. And when I say that, I don't mean like how you have technical expertise to manipulate paint or wood or something. <clears throat> I'm referring to the way in which the artist encounters the world, uh, what they find around them, and communicates those experiences back to the audience. Uh, so for me, the two essential activities of the artist are in this uh, title here, paying attention and reporting back. <clears throat> and I take these remarks, um, these, this definition from remarks made by the filmmaker James Binning. And I'm going to try to get this to play. Um, between 2005 and 2008, Binning made 16 trips to the Great Salt Lake, to the Spiral Jetty, and the result was his film, Casting a Glance, which was screened at Sundance in 2008. The film consists of a series of shots, each about a minute long, in which the camera is locked in a single position, and the only action is the movement of the sky, the water, the light, what's going on at the time, the ambient sounds. In the Q&A after the film, Benning gave his definition of what it is to be an artist. <laughs> he said, an artist is someone who pays attention 
first step is paying attention. It's certainly become trying to go on against people who are involved in something that doesn't have anything to do with where they are. But I really, I believe that there's more going on around any of us at any time than we will see unless we purposely pay attention. <clears throat> so when I was asked to give this presentation, it was because one of the organizers had become aware of my artist books. <clears throat> um, people may wonder, well, what is an artist book? And uh, in fact, the term encompasses a wide variety of works. And these three that I'm going to show today are only like a one subsection of that genre. <clears throat> the University of Utah here has an excellent book arts program. It's on the fourth floor of the Marriott Library. And that's where I got my uh, introduction to this. Um, for me, an artist book is an opportunity to integrate text and images and in an interactive three-dimensional format that allows for communication of thoughts and feelings and ideas and experiences with others. If you have any experience going to art galleries or museums, you know that the artist is asked to give, um, present what's called an artist statement. And that is printed out and put up on the wall someplace where it's pretty easily ignored. <laughs> when I make a book, I have the opportunity to integrate those kind of texts uh, into the main body of the work. I also have the opportunity to, to suggest, uh, through the structure of the book, the order in which I'm trying to present, uh, invite the viewer to encounter the work. The downside of artist books is that they're usually somewhat fragile and sometimes valuable and therefore kept in the special collections section of the library and you only get to see them um, by appointment or something. So I'm really glad that I'm able to use this presentation to show you um, kind of what goes into making something like that. Uh, the three artist books that I'm showing you here um, came about as a result of an invitation I received last summer to, uh, from a curator in Denver to participate in an exhibit called Westward Bound which was supposed to um, reflect on contemporary or historical uh, viewpoints and concerns of the area known as the American West. And so they were displayed as part of that exhibit last, uh, last month in Telluride as part of the American Academy of Bookbindings program. <clears throat> the first book I'm going to show you is called On Finding a Crystal of Salt. It consists of a cube made of six interlocking pyramids held together by a wrapper containing a narrative about my experience finding the crystal and what I learned about it. The design covering the outside of the cube is an abstracted pattern derived from close-up photos of salt crystals and inspired by the diffraction patterns made when this crystal structure of halite, which is the mineral name for salt, is studied by X-ray crystallography. The background picture behind the text is of the lake at the place that I found the crystal. I wanted a way to add emphasis to the crystal and an interactive element to the book, so I put an LED under the crystal, which is activated by a magnetic switch, which usually works. So, uh, on a visit to the spiral jetty in 2017, I saw someone reach down into the salty pools that are there when the water is at a certain level and pull out a pyramidal crystal of salt. The form of the crystal was fascinating to me. It looked like some kind of ancient Mesopotamian ziggurat from Babylon or someplace. Later, when I did research, I found that this is what's called a hopper crystal. It results from uneven growth. The edges grow faster than the center. Normally, if you look at table salt under the magnifying glass, you see that the crystals are cubes. 
However, if you look at what's known as fleur de sel, you see those crystals are the same form as the ones that I was given, only much smaller. And the flower of salt is prized, 20 to $30 a pound, uh, because the structure of the crystal, are you not hearing? Oh, sorry, okay. Um, the flower of salt is prized because the structure of the crystal makes it dissolve easier in your mouth and enhances the taste of the salt. <clears throat> this particular property of the salt, that's the kind of crystals, was noticed by the Frito-Lay company. They use a lot of salt. In 2020, everybody had to pa have a pandemic project, and one of their pandemic projects was to figure out how to artificially grow these type of crystals. So they went in their lab with some salt water and some industrial strength Everclear, and they figured out that if you add about 2% of ethyl alcohol to your saturated salt solution, you can grow these kind of step pyramid crystals, artificial fleur de sel. As a result for this, they applied for and obtained a patent in 2021, which is the document here, for the commercial production of these kinds of salt crystals. Their reasoning behind this was, since this type of crystal tastes saltier per pound or per ounce than regular salt, if they use these kind of salt, they can claim reduced sodium. <laughs> so you can see the similarity between the drawing on their patent application and the illustration on the wrapper that contains the pyramids in my book. The reason that I'm dwelling on this is not because there's any connection between the Great Salt Lake and Fritos. Uh, it's because looking, researching, and understanding what you see or what you're holding in your hand is part of paying attention. Now, the next book is called A Precious Bit Remaining, uh, which of course refers to the present state of the Great Salt Lake, which is rapidly drying up, and whose ecosystem is in process of collapse. This book work is in the form of a reliquary for the lake, referencing the ornate containers made to house the relics of saints, often bones, in medieval Europe. The relic here is a bone, probably from a seagull, which is Utah's state bird it's, that I found by the lake. Just as the bones of the saints were often encrusted in precious jewels, this bone is encrusted in salt crystals. It's hidden behind doors in the interior of the book structure. In order to access the relic, it's necessary to unfold several pages of images and text about the lake. The text pages are photo collages combining my photographs of the lake and its surroundings with images of historical maps and documents about the lake that predicted over 100 years ago that the lake would dry up because of the diversion of water for irrigation. So now I'd like to go through and talk a little bit about each of these text pages. This is a title page, and under the title page is a photograph from 2019 of the beach at White Rock Bay at Antelope Island. And uh, the water hasn't been up that far since then, to my knowledge. Next, there are a series of four text and photo collages. The first of these centers around a map made by Baron La Hontan, published in 1703. The Baron, like many others, was looking for a water route that would connect the Mississippi to the Pacific. Let's, let's see. There's the Mississippi, and he's trying to go this way. <clears throat> His map is very inaccurate to the point of becoming fanciful. His account of meeting with the Gnosticeres and their Muslim League slaves who knew the Tahuglucks, who lived by a salt lake a thousand miles in circumference, certainly sounds far-fetched. It is described in the text on the right here. <clears throat> the salt lake is way over to the left, next to the word Muslim leak. And the lozenge-shaped objects 
there in the center, those are supposedly medals that were worn um, by some of these folks and who supposedly were made by these Tahuglok people. And it's, the account says that they looked like copper and had the property that when they were heated, they got heavier. Well, it's interesting that copper does appear to get heavier when it's heated, because when it's heated, it tends to oxidize, and the weight of the oxygen is added to the weight of the copper, and so it appears that the metal is, the, well, the whole glob is a little bit heavier. Uh, and today, we know that copper obviously does occur in the vicinity of the lake. The uh, the mine out there at Bingham Canyon is said to be the most productive in history. Uh, let's see. I have just gotten myself messed up here. <clears throat> there we go. Okay, so at the bottom then, the great blue heron, the egret, and then at the very bottom, the California gulls. So those are all there by the lake. <clears throat> On the next page, we see the very first monograph of the USGS. It's about, the title is about Lake Bonneville. Captain Benjamin Bonneville was an early explorer who published what was arguably the first map of the Great Basin, which showed exclusively an interior drainage. Uh, on that map, which is reproduced on this page of my book, Bonneville named what we know today as the Great Salt Lake after himself. The author of the geological survey report, Grove Carl Gilbert, however, chose to name the much larger prehistoric lake, Lake Bonneville, and that's the way that we know it today. Captain Bonneville had many adventures in the West, but he didn't compile them into book form himself. Instead, he sold his story to Washington Irving, who was better known for writing about Rip Van Winkle and the Headless Horseman. Irving published The Adventures of Captain Bonneville based on notes from an expedition of 1832. Bonneville's tales of the Great Salt Lake proved to be too much even for Washington Irving, who deemed them, quote, clothed by his imagination with vague and ideal charms. It is now thought that Bonneville never saw the lake himself. Irving says he has evidently taken part of his ideas about it from the representations of others. The USGS monograph, though, correctly predicted the present state of the Great Salt Lake, where the islands have ceased to be islands, but are instead connected to the mainland. And here's the excerpt shown on this page here um, under the heading Future Changes. <clears throat> says, those human agencies which tend to increase the water supply of the lake, namely grazing and draining, have acquired a status that is practically permanent, but those which tend to diminish the supply, namely plowing and irrigation, have not yet ceased to increase. Human agency is thus destined to play an important part in the determination of the future history of the lake. The next 10 years will witness its shrinkage for lack of affluent water to a size smaller than has before been observed. The final system of irrigation will include the storage and artificial reservoirs of the flood water of all the minor streams and will cause the lake to be deprived of all inflow except from saline creeks and from the unused share of Bear River. One effect of such a contraction of the lake will be to simplify its outline. Antelope, Stansbury, Carrington, Hat, and Dolphin Islands will be permanently united to the land. Bear River Bay will be drained nearly to the southern extremity of Promontory and the bay east of Antelope Island will be drained nearly to the northern end of that island. This was 1890. And of course, this is exactly what's happened. Uh, thankfully, it took longer than 10 years. Uh, the map here of Stansbury Island shows, um, the contemporary map shows it connected to the main um, area. 
And uh, of course, there's the American avocet, which is one of the birds that we commonly see around the, on the lake. <clears throat> okay, let's see, the third page here, the background is the text from an article in Scientific American from 1904. <clears throat> now, um, again, I have messed myself up. Okay, so it says here, um, again, this is like, it's presented graphically as a background, but the idea is that you're supposed to pay enough attention to it to read some of it. So since you obviously can't, I'm going to read a little bit. It says, statistics indicate that the Great Salt Lake, the Dead Sea of America, is doomed, that it is gradually drying up. The opinion now almost universally prevails among scientists that this mysterious body of water, located at an altitude of 4,210 feet above sea level and 1,000 miles inward, and has but a single rival, the Dead Sea of Palestine, is certainly within the course of a half a century to disappear from the map. Some scientists who have made a careful study of the fluctuation of the lake for the past several years even declare that it will be dried up within a quarter of a century. A discussion of the lake's fluctuations and theories about where the water comes from and goes follows. And here is the final paragraph. In summary, it seems that owing to the decrease in water that reaches the lake caused by extensive irrigation, the atmosphere absorbs more water than the lake receives from its feed streams. Thus have scientists evidence to support their declaration that the lake will gradually dry up. Again, this is uh, 1904. And the dome structure to the right is a weather radar installation at Farmington Bay. It's like looking for rain or snow or some kind of precipitation to add water to the lake. And below that, you see the great blue herons nest, nest on the platforms there at Farmington Bay. And the map in the background is Stansbury's map from 1852. The background on the final page is of the dry lake bed at the Howard Slough Wildlife Management Area near Roy. And there is attached to this a little booklet that I made concerning containing excerpts from the transcripts of the proceedings of the Irrigation Congress held in Los Angeles in 1893. And this image shows the inside of the book. You can see on the right some of the remarks made, made by John Wesley Powell, the explorer of the Colorado River and the first director of the US Geological Survey. Some of you are probably familiar with some of what Powell said, but I want to read it because it is so clear and so clearly relevant today. <clears throat> Major J.W. Powell, upon being introduced, spoke as follows. The water which is showered upon the land comes from the heavens. There is a runoff from the mountains down to the plains and in the valleys, but gradually the stream becomes smaller until all the waters are evaporated all are returned to the heavens. Now, what I wish to make clear to you is this. There is not water enough, runoff water enough, to irrigate all the lands. That when all the rivers are used, when all the streams are used, when all the canyon waters are taken up, when all the wells are dug in this arid region, there is still not sufficient water to irrigate all the land. There is not sufficient water to irrigate all the land which could be irrigated all the irrigable land, only a small portion of it can be irrigated. There is not water enough and can never be. A quantity of water can never be conserved sufficient to irrigate more than one third of the land already owned by private individuals. Not one more acre of land should be granted to individuals for irrigation purposes. There is not water enough. I try to make that clear and strong to you the amount is insufficient to irrigate the whole of the lands. I have studied the subject very thoroughly and have had a large force of men to help me make this study. If it is true, it is one of profound importance. 
Supposing you could put a roof over all the land in Arizona or Idaho or Nevada or California, suppose you could put a roof over all the land and gather all the rain that falls from the heavens, could you gather water enough to irrigate the land? I ask you the question, men of common sense, to appreciate the fact, appreciate the quantity of water which falls from the heavens, quantities of water which are necessary for irrigation. Save it all, save every drop of it, put a roof over all, and put it all in the canals. Even if you could gather it all, it would not irrigate it all. Now, I want to say to you, as years go by, the interest in these water rights will increase swiftly, that you are piling up a heritage of conflict of all the waters. That is what you are doing. What matter it whether I am popular or unpopular? I tell you, gentlemen, you are piling up a heritage of conflict and litigation over water rights where there is not enough water to supply these lands. Then on the left, we see the reply of the delegate from Utah, William Ellsworth Smythe, who was kind of an evangelist for the irrigation movement. Mr. Smythe of Utah says, I wish to say for the people of Utah that I declare that the statements made by Major Powell in regard to the extent of irrigable water supply insofar as it has reference to Utah is absolutely false. And I desire it to so appear upon the records. Uh, 1893. The irony here is that Major Powell and Mr. Smythe basically wanted the same thing. The idea was that irrig uh, irrigation would enable individuals to settle on modest-sized farms, which they would farm in such a way as to provide for their family and have enough left over to barter or sell to provide the things they couldn't grow, to survive and be comfortable. The idea of exporting hay to China would they <laughs> never would have thought of that. So the idea of the land coming with water rights was to ensure that some large developer upstream didn't compound the water and then force the farmers downstream to pay for it. It was a wonderfully idealistic vision. But Mr. Smythe refused to pay attention to the reality that Major Powell described. And I think that's important partly because as artists, we tend to be idealistic. And it's kind of part of the job of both artists and scientists to figure out some way to do something that everybody else says is impossible. So paying attention can get tricky. <clears throat> it's now obvious that pretty much nobody paid attention to uh, Major Powell at the time, and we are in the position that he predicted. The chart on the left hand side of my little booklet shows only a partial list of the water rights litigation that's going on at the present time. And so it's no coincidence that we're having this symposium at the law school. <clears throat> so now we get, let's see, now we get to the doors uh, that open to reveal the relic inside. And the abstract patterns on the doors and around the bone are derived from photos of the patterns of the sand, the salt, and the water on the shore of the lake. The final book that I'll be showing is called Skeletons in the Lake. The title refers to the dead tumbleweeds and other vegetation that is often seen floating in the lake. Those skeletons are used as metaphors for the lake dying as a result of its water being cut off, allowing what remains to evaporate away. The inner panorama that is revealed when the book is completely open is of White Rock Bay at Antelope Island State Park. I'm standing on the white rock seen in the foreground. The rock is supposed to be surrounded by water and inaccessible from the shore as a nesting place for birds. The receding lake level has extended the beach all the way out to the rock so that visitors regularly climb on it. There's a text there at the bottom that describes the situation. 
Skeletons in the lake, dead but floating, beautiful but fragile, or because fragile, we are fragile like that. Now there is still water to float the fragile and reflect the sky. When the water is gone, nothing will float. There will be skeletons resting on a greater skeleton, the dead lake. Sometimes we feel we see beauty in dead things, the smoothness of polished bones, the bewildering interlacing of cracks as the earth's skin dries and pulls apart. But we will struggle to find beauty in clouds of poison dust sweeping towards us on the wind. We won't be there to see the beauty of our own bones when the water's gone. So, we are here now to figure out how that doesn't happen. I hope that all of us that we've, we're here and the ones that have presented and will present are able to figure out something. And uh, I appreciate you for paying attention. All right, we'll see if this is working now. Thank you so much for uh, telling us today about how the artist encounters the world and teaching us to pay attention and uh, about how we can seek and get inspiration from the natural world, especially from the Great Salt Lake at this time. And we actually ended right on time, so we don't have time for questions, but uh, thank you so much. Let's give Jim one more round of applause. Thank you again, Jim. I know that provided inspiration for me, and I could tell from the audience uh, and from the questions we received that it provided that it provided inspiration to all of us. And uh, may we take home the sentiment that uh, we should pay attention. Um, next, I'm delighted to introduce our next panel. Uh, they will be speaking to us uh, about. Uh, finding and moving water to the Great Salt Lake. So I know that this is a topic that everybody is eager to hear about. And uh, our three panelists almost need no introduction, but I'm going to give a quick introduction uh, just in case. And if you want to find out more information on the panelists, you can see their bios uh, on the website. And again, I would encourage you to go to slido.com if you have any questions and uh, we'll have some time for questions at the end. So let's bring our panelists up here and then I'll, then I'll introduce them. <laughs> 